All right. Uh, here we are. Welcome to the first Up Close of 2021. Uh, I'm Artistic Director of Unexpected Productions, Randy Dixon, and in this slot each week, I talk to somebody about improv or improv-related stuff, and uh, they answer. Uh, it's as simple as that. Uh, and this week, my guest is Mara Siciliano, who I will um, give a little more of a plug uh, after a few announcements. One is, uh, thank you again for those who gave to our fundraiser. Uh, it was amazing and it was so great. And, you know, I thought this, the spirit of improv uh, came alive. Um, so, but sincerely, thank you everyone who gave. Um, and over the year, everyone who gave not only money, but time. Um, so I appreciate that. And uh, what do we have upcoming? Well, uh, you may have noticed if you are a fan of our shows that we haven't, we didn't do a show. Uh, the last couple nights. We're actually taking two weeks off, two weekends off, um, to kind of retool and remaster everything uh, because when this all started, we kind of piecemealed it all together. And so now we're trying to like, let's stop, kind of put it all in the proper place. And so we're going to be starting on February 3rd with duos. And then February 6th, we'll have a brand new show, um, which is based on storytelling and improvisation. That'll be on running on Saturday nights. And for both of those shows, we've moved our start time to 7 p.m. Pacific time. So, uh, so we're basically an hour and a half earlier to allow for some of our East Coast friends to, uh, to enjoy. Um, and uh, hopefully they will. So uh, we have classes going now. We will be having some specialty classes. All of this, including uh, if you wish to make a, a donation, can be found at unexpectedproductions.org org so all of our our stuff is there but let's get into the chat so uh mars siciliano is my guest and she's a company member with unexpected and how long have you been in the company uh officially since 2008 Ooh. but i was an apprentice from <laughs> 1998 until about 2000. all right well we'll, we'll come back to that I'm yeah. sorry. Uh, <laughs> Part of our sorted past. Um, <laughs> no, not that sorted, but uh, cool. So yeah, you've been around a while. And uh -huh. uh, so uh, you were an ensemble member and we're going to talk about movement and dance. And then hopefully uh, at the end, we'll have some time left over to talk about some history stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but as I begin most of these, oh, and I should say before we get into the questions, if you have a comment or a chat uh, or a question, uh, feel free to put it into the uh, into the chat below and I'll try to keep track of that. Um, so I normally start these by asking, uh, how did you discover improv or what was the, you know, your first exposure to it and what made you decide that you wanted to do it? Yeah, I was really lucky. I, uh, I had a great high school drama program. Um, I went to high school in a suburb outside of Portland, Oregon, and I had a great, a great theater experience starting pretty young. And my high school, uh, it was a value for them that we also have improv training. So we did um, workshops and we, you know, it was taught in the, you know, basic drama all the way up to the upper levels. And I remember really enjoying it then a lot. And then, uh, uh, yeah, and it's funny because I actually got the improv award in high school. <laughs> along with best actress um there was two oh. awards which i think is funny uh which i realize now it's like they couldn't be combined like you had a best actress and best <laughs> improviser like they weren't there were two separate awards right. and so uh but that's i mean it was it was still a, a big value for the the program so then um uh and then interestingly, the high school had all this emphasis on improv, but then when I went to college, there was very little. It wasn't taught at all at University of Washington at the time. This is the 90s, so it could have changed. But I was doing a production for the Snoqualmie Falls Theater in uh, 1998, and they couldn't pay us, but they could provide workshops. And so I went to Unexpected Productions for a workshop that was taught by Keith Dahlgren. And it was like, oh, I, I forgot. I just, I love, I love this. I feel, I feel good at it. I'm, I'm enjoying it. I'm having fun. And so uh, I started taking classes that summer. Um, immediately after that workshop, I said, how can I keep going? And Keith 
was like, oh, we'll put you in this class right here. So that, I believe probably that fall I started uh, taking classes. And then I also, uh, in order to pay for them, worked as the soundboard with the row of cassettes and, and uh, watched like tons of improv, like was there every Friday and Saturday for theater sports. So that kind of just got the ball rolling. And so I went to the University of Washington, worked on my degree, and then on the weekends, I was pretty much at Unexpected Productions. So that's kind of a long-winded, like, how I got going. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. So when you started again, did you pull the old Best Improviser Award off the shelf? And <laughs> it off and... I should, actually, I should have brought my yearbook, because it's in the yearbook, right? There's like the headshot <laughs> with me. Uh, it's funny, I brought that up once, on stage and the other improvisers made fun of me for, uh, for, like, for bringing that up because like oh you're so big you got the improv award and I was like no I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to bring it up as like it's something funny so uh yeah I, I, yeah so I've always liked improv <laughs> cool. yeah well uh and let's see I might be I might be killing this name but Jennifer Janetsky Pivar oh yes that's my neighbor. <laughs> okay. She says Mara, Mara is just amazing. So oh. nothing, nothing to live up to in this yeah. conversation, but Thanks, Jennifer. <laughs> we're, ex we're expecting amazing. Um, so. I'm very, very popular out here in the summer. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> All right. Well, let's jump in. So we have the hour tends to fly by. So, um, uh, so uh, in thinking about this conversation, and in conversations that we've had in the past. I mean, one thing that I've noticed a lot of that we've tried to do in improv and it needs to be done is you have all these different systems of movement and dance and, and ways to, you know, so there's the Le bon system, you know, and, um, and you know, I don't know how many we, we've done, there are a lot. Um, and, you know, tends to sort of be, be that way. And as an improv movement wise for me, I've kind of cafeteria approached it, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a lot of that um kind of thing what for someone who's not not that they can't move but uh but then it's not the first place they go to so let's say an intellectual improviser who might have a sense of rhythm and a sense of movement um how do you think you should approach the incorporation of movement slash dance into into your work um well my first thought was i think it starts with allowing for silence um, and with that silence comes a physical impulse versus a word impulse. Does that make sense? So like, um, yeah, so I guess, I mean, there's lots of ways you could approach it physically. Like you could try to become more physical and in tune with your own body um, outside of the theater. But like, I think if you are going into a show and you're like, I want to be more physical, you could you know, mini theater games, right? You could assign a physical characteristic, uh, could be subtle, right? I think that's the thing too. It's like, it doesn't have to be huge. And often I think uh, little subtle cues can have immense impact on a stage. And um, you could be doing things that are like small and it'll still read really well. So, you know, there's, yeah. So like you could approach, uh, like it could be as small as like I'm going to just focus on my elbow or I'm just going to focus on my shoulder or um, I'm going to focus on a physical malady that maybe my character has and go from there instead of being like oh, I'm going to play a big jolly character or I'm going to jump into a jig. Um, I think you know because we get stuck in our talking head a lot and uh, yeah so it's like what can we do to kind of get out of there and and like, if you're standing in silence, what can you do to physically show that you're present? Like, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. <laughs> so of those two then, uh, if I'm understanding you correct and feel free to correct me, mm -hmm. um, you know, it sounds, you know, you're um, endorsing a sort of just kind of a movement in your body, just being more comfortable moving on stage. Yeah. And just crossing a stage or sitting down or moving in a way that just enhances the movement versus, say, a full on abstract dance piece. Um, yes, which right. I'm all for. I'm all for, <laughs> I'm all for abstract dance oh, pieces. Yeah. But I think, especially in improv, it's like 
we do a ballet and we're really physical and then we move on to the stagey stuff right, right. so it's like how do we you know just put a little more movement into our improv and and uh i think that's getting better i think people are a lot more open to it um and are going for it a little bit more and you know not that there's not a place for like those big physical characters but uh yeah it's just nice to see a little bit more movement and um yeah uh, just in general which <laughs> I, i'm sorry i'm like it's, it's interesting to have all these visuals in my head and then like how do i put this into words so let me know if i'm not right. being clear <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering can, can you go into more detail with that because you and i've talked about this before just about not uh, maybe frustration is too strong a word um that we've talked about like being the intellectual floating head improviser who's talking all the time uh mm -hmm. with this strong impulse that you have to be moving yeah. and trying to bridge those differences not only within yourself but also with the fellow improvisers you are on stage who may or may not be comfortable right. uh, doing more or less so how's that how's that sit in you uh it, it's it's tough because i feel like i spent probably the first this is the history part the first half of my improv life trying really hard to be the hold still um i'm going to be super funny and witty and i'm going to zap everybody with my one-liners but having more success as a physical improviser and that could be um providing support that's physical you know with two characters that are maybe the focus or um just reaching out and actually physically touching the improviser or um uh, uh doing more abstract stuff like if a character is you know if you see two people that are standing still and they're they're having a lot of back and forth coming up behind and and um instead of speaking the inner monologue like being the inner monologue like making the inner monologue with the, your body or illustrating mm -hmm. what they're saying physically um which yeah can get kind of abstract, but I find that the audience really responds to that. It's like oh, so you're not like taking away, you know, you're not like hey, I'm the third person coming in. Instead, you're uh, embellishing the existing action, um, and just yeah, getting improvisers out of their their body and just moving around, having uh, like you know sitting, standing, working with that. Um, yeah, that's. That's what comes to mind when you mention like how do you yeah because I, I definitely have had to have this reckoning of like okay i'm this is this is for my strength is and um early on i felt like that wasn't what improv wanted <laughs> as much and i think that's changed and i i actually found a note that i wrote down where you you said you're an embodied improviser uh don't don't stop doing it but it tends to be less appreciated um which I, I i still really value that because i think uh it's just good to know that like it's it's okay you can be like a super physical <laughs> improviser and still um right. feel like you're successful you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> well it, it's interesting and again that notion of uh i've noticed uh, actually in the last actually one happened yesterday and one happened a couple weeks ago both downtown uh both with people who uh maybe had something uh, or, or, or were less than there. Yeah. Um, but one was, and you know, and downtown's just crazy now with, with uh, yeah. just people doing the weird stuff. And so one time I was on the bus and uh, just going down there and there was a guy dancing. He was dancing quite well, but uh, he just didn't have any pants on. Oh. Um, but, but I looked at him and it was kind of like, you wouldn't believe this if this happened in an improv scene. Like you just wouldn't, believe a guy without his pants dancing you know is is normal right. <laughs> on the bus uh is one and then yesterday was actually a lesson in stillness there was a woman um standing in the middle of one of the lanes and a bus pulled up to her and she was just like for, i mean she was like a statue wow and he like honked and he was yelling out the window for her to move and she wouldn't oh, move gosh. she wouldn't move and then finally the bus went or went around her and then uh um I was on my way, so I didn't find out exactly what happened to her. There were some people going out to, I think, check on her, but but it was so weird to see this person in the middle of all this other stuff and movement going around this just perfectly still person. And that idea of the juxtaposition, which I think is a big part of of movement. Um, right. That idea, you know, you were saying about silence earlier, but also that notion of, you know, silence makes 
the, the talking part, the vocal part stronger in the same way that stillness makes the movement part stronger? Yeah, yes, because my first thought is that uh, if, it, if the scene of the dancing pantless man was interpreted in improv, it would go, the first, first of all, to illustrate a I'm not all there person, you would have an improviser ranting and raving at the sky, right? Like that's the stereotype, like, ah, ah, and like maybe he'd yell at the audience, ah. But, but it could be just as powerful if he or she just busted out some crazy non sequitur moves and accepting it, right? Versus being like, oh, that Jim didn't take his break dance meds and now he's all crazy, you know, but like accepting that you, you don't need a monologue, like an I'm crazy monologue. You can have an I'm, I'm crazy dance and get the same response. Because right. when you talk about silence, I think if you try to start a uh, scene with silence, oftentimes you have to put some movement in there. And that can feel really unsettling to the other improvisers sometimes. And it takes a lot of restraint to not immediately like dive in or pick up the microphone backstage and start filling in those silences instead of allowing it to just be uh, a, a movement or an offer that's a movement and where do we go from there and and also that stillness and silence are movement we think of movement and improv as like musical theater ballet and that, that's totally great it's a great place to to start and we we love those games but also like like this whole discussion is like how do we get more physicality into our improv and right and what does that look like yeah right and do you think uh you make that move an improviser on stage with you tries to justify it by oh she didn't take her meds or yeah. um whatever it was that sense of the offer from your fellow player do you think that's coming from a place of fear of not understanding kind of yeah. Movement piece. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, because it's so easy to define when we're always talking, right? And uh, if we're talking, that means we're we're engaging. But if we're, uh, well, one silence on stage can often be really scary, um, especially if you're in your head and you're you're not completely watching, right? Because suddenly, if there's silence, you're like, you know, oh, I missed something. Uh, what are they doing? Uh, are, you know, are we allowed? Like, why are we allowing this? And so we and I'm totally guilty of this, right? We pile on and then you get the over offering thing. But um, yeah, taking that time to, I, I mean, it's of course, and eventually the movement's gonna have to be justified. Um, and often, you know, unless it's a totally silent scene, uh, that's, gonna, that's gonna happen. Um, but I think we dismiss the movement portion and then we begin the scene. I think that that's the impulse. And I think that just comes from, yeah, fear and worry that the audience won't catch up or they don't get it. But um, the audience really does get it and they really do respond to physical offers, um, sometimes even more because they're also like moving, and, you know, shuffling around. And then if things are still or not quite so verbal, I think it does cause them to stop and kind of perk up a little like, oh, what's going on up here? Just, you know what I mean? Right, right sure. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. Well, it's almost like, you know, especially if we start something with some movement offers, I, I see a lot of improvisers just sort of treat that like, like those are empty calories. It's like, oh, well, that, there's nothing going on there because we're not talking because we're not yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, versus looking at the physicality and going, oh, no, there's something there. There's an emotion there. There's an attitude. Yeah. There's something that's going on. Yeah. Like I've, I've had really intense scenes where I'm just like, or, or overwhelmed scenes where I'm like, oh God, I don't know what I'm, I don't know what I'm doing, or I don't know what's going on. And I'll insert just, I'll just start moving in a way. And, uh, and part of it's to buy myself some thinking time, but also because it just looks so different, right? So it's changing, like whatever we were stuck in, it, it's changing it a little subtly, right? And, and that's, that's a strategy, you know, it doesn't, you know, it's a, it can give you a little bit of time to catch up, um, you know, when you're, when you're in it, or if you're like, okay, there's a lot of talking going on and I'm not, we're not quite on the same page. How can we get on the same page? Um, and it can be radical, right? Like I've thrown myself on the floor and been like, let's justify this, right? It's like a, I'm bailing out <laughs> or it can be subtle. Like suddenly my character is so moved by this discussion. They're like twitching or they're they're like moving in a way that is indicating how they're feeling versus like, I'm mad at you, you know? 
So right. there's lots of ways to put it in there. Right. So uh, I guess jumping back into a, a personal moment uh, or personal question before I forget, before we get away from that, which yeah. is, um, you know, I've grown up with spontaneous improviser Mara. Um, <laughs> you have. And, and uh, um, but you know, I know that you you did dance, and it seems to me, and I may be wrong. I mean, I know there are certain types of improvisational dance, but like ballet and whatnot, it seems to be pretty regimented in terms of trying to get everything spontaneous out, um, right. so that you know exactly what's going to happen. So, did you adjust, or were you uncomfortable with that, or where does that sit with you now? Could you see yourself being back in that environment? Um, um, you know, yeah, with, going from like choreographed ballet to physical right. improviser right um that's a good question uh i uh it never um sat well with me i think is the answer so i switched from ballet at 17 because this is a classic right and didn't, didn't have the body for it and uh right it was exhausting and i had to choose Kind of between theater and pursuing a dance a ballet career and then i found contemporary dance modern dance in college and in the 90s improv was really taking off in the contemporary dance world there was a whole contact improv scene that i go back and forth making fun of because basically it's just everybody rolling around and like someone eventually gets broke but it's like you know it's like weight sharing and and improvised lifts and like that was too far over for me but um but there was a lot more uh at least in my training as an undergrad um improv was part of the uh dance modern dance scene um you generated you know, you generated material from it, you found material, and it was far less like, now you do this, now you do that. And ballet had already not been a great fit for me. So when I found modern dance, I was like, oh yes, this is it. Um, and we've discussed this, it tends to get too extreme. Oftentimes the audience will leave and they were like, I have no idea what's going on. So it's like, you gotta find like the nice balance. So going from the ballet world was, I feel like I was already breaking up with that world. So improv was like the new boyfriend that just made it way cooler. Right. <laughs> and then again, I was really lucky because in the 90s, uh, it was all about improv in the contemporary dance scene. And so it, it worked really well. Um, and so it wasn't that big of a deal. And I'm not a very kind of, you know, like I'm pretty easygoing in that respect. I didn't find a lot of comfort in strict choreography and part of it's because again I just didn't have that like flawless like technique that really you need if you're going to execute the, the tight choreography that like classical ballets require um yeah so it was was fine <laughs> more of a modern dancer is what I'm saying cool yeah I mean yeah. modern dance is still choreographed but it's different Right, we should offer a class for UP with you teaching. Just call it Everyone Rolls Around. I know, I'm gonna get so much heat. I, I don't know what it's like now because I'm not as involved, but anybody that talks to me about the modern dance scene, it just feels like for the a good solid 10 years, and this would also go on stage where there was no nothing other than like, you know, drums, like light drums, and then people literally just like circling each other and then like rolling around and, uh, and that that takes a lot of trust is all I'm right so yeah contact improv was a huge thing and it probably still is and it there's a place for it but i was never it's never that big into it right. I prefer my contact in, i prefer my improv uh in the in the drama world versus dance <laughs> right so a few minutes ago you were talking about um the um you know, focusing on like one part of your body, like your shoulder or whatever, uh, as a way in is, I mean, what other tips do you have for somebody who's trying to get more physical? I'm sorry, I'm just adjusting my light really tough. Um, you know, uh, just like an entry level, so somebody wants to begin kind of making that an element in their work, um, would, you, would you say focus on one part or is there some kind of skill or kind of thing you can remind yourself before a scene um, that will help you? Oh boy, it's like a, what are the crib notes of this? I mean, uh, 
everybody's coming to the stage with their own physical background. So I'm always curious, like what people's thoughts and feelings are on their own movement. Like, what do they, do they take walks? Do they do yoga? Do they do nothing? Do they sit all day? Um, do they have a physical job? Do they not? And then, you know, it, all of that is, then we all walk to get places. So I would say if you're a new improviser trying to figure out ways to be more physical, to pay more attention to your physicality in general. Like if you're going to the grocery store and you find yourself maneuvering a cart or maneuvering yourself around, uh, just noticing like, how do you move? Um, mirrors are a huge thing in the dance world. We spend all our time staring at mirrors. It's funny because we don't do any mirror, any stuff in improv that I can think of, or even in theater, there's very little, little mirrors. But the mirror is there for you and it's okay to look at it. It's okay to like look at yourself and see how you're moving and how you hold yourself and what your posture is um, and just get a familiarity with yourself. I think people are pretty disconnected from their self, them, themselves physically for a lot of reasons. Um, I am hyper focused on myself and my body to the point where I think it's a negative. Like, um, you know, I know there are people that have no concept of what's going on down below the neck, but so uh, I, I think just getting uh, physically like acquainted with yourself physically. Um, there are certainly like lovely improv games that you can play, which we've done, like mirroring each other, um, you know, following each other. I love the just standard, like follow somebody and mimic their walk or follow, a, you know, subtly find something that they're doing and emphasize. You can also use the other players, right? See how, how other people are moving, um, match them, which is something I've been doing a lot or was, is uh, picking somebody on stage and matching them physically. And anytime they move, I would subtly mirror it. Um, and sometimes it become a game and other times they wouldn't notice or, or it wouldn't get noticed and that's fine. But you can use your other players um, because everybody is physical in some way on stage, um, even, the most, even the most rigid talking head. Um, so that's, that's my first kind of thought, yeah. Hmm. And in terms of the other, um, in improv, um, you know, this might be a trick question to be thinking about, but, uh, you know, aside from things like, you know, ballet or these uh, direct physical restriction games that sort of require movement, are there certain games that you like uh, that you think either could use more movement or bring more movement out in a person? Um, oh, boy. I, um, I tend to like, well, when we do like warm ups, I tend to like the games <laughs> that are um, uh, doing the hardy, hardy, hardy one, like, you know, the ones that are like, people are um, thinking, but they're being required to move too. So there's like, and I, I'm blanking on all of them. This is embarrassing, but like um, the Beastie Boy rap one or um, um like even doing rhythmic games and you can see everybody kind of like getting into it like even the most like i'm not a hate warming up kind of person will totally instinctively be like moving their shoulders and getting into it um and so i feel like that's i, I feel like a good physical warm-up backstage is always a great way to guarantee a little more physicality and to do ones that are not specifically like we're going to do a movement warm up everybody so sun salutation we go i mean that's great i've done that too but like ones where people are sort of forgetting forgetting themselves right they're, they're like kind of forgetting that they have this body and they're they're moving more instinctively and i'm fine and this ties in off obviously music is and rhythm is a wonderful way to tap into that so like how do you move when you listen to music how do you do it so um I don't know. I feel like I'm like, get back to me on that one and I'll come with you with a list of games for everybody. But for me, I'm trying to think of times when I see people kind of letting it loose a little bit more than they normally would. Um, and it's usually backstage during warmups when we're all like, we're all in it and we're all trying to connect and get going. Um, those are good shows. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. So a while back ago, I made mention of, you know, all these various systems of movement and dance and ideas and philosophies. Um, are there particular ones that you like or would recommend for people to 
look more into just as sort of again um you know a, a, a non dancer necessarily but you know just somebody who's interested in getting into movement um are there is there books or a philosophy or a type of movement that you think would be a great place to go or that you recommend like when you teach um i always recommend that you learn ballet basics only because um you know even though dance has a long 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 history uh fortunately unfortunately ballet still is sort of its root um, even though there's been lots of wonderful discussions lately about like, um, actually there's the history of African dance and like South American, you know, older forms of dance were around, but the, you know, the ballet still is uh, put up on that pedestal, whether we like it or not. And so I, when I teach, I often will do um, ballet, like first position, second position, third position, and then I'll show a a variety of cheats in the sense that if you do this on stage, the audience will be like, oh my God. <laughs> and it's like, uh, passe, you lift your knee up. You know, you, you, I, can't, I should have been standing. Um, <laughs> passe, uh, susu, you put your arms over your head, you go up on tiptoes. Uh, beret, now you move these across, you know, you tiptoe across the stage with your arms up. Uh, I love borrowing from Swan Lake, as you know. Uh, if I have time, I'll teach how to do the dying swan, because if you finish anything with the dying swan, the audience loses their mind. So um, I think it's, I shouldn't say cheats, but like just a basic ballet 101 where the audience sees this, they recognize that it's an actual ballet position and they think you must be trained by Russian, you know, um, and they're not hard. Like ballet in itself is actually very not easy, but it's, it's, it's a language, it's very straightforward. Um, where it gets hard is like flexibility, like can you put your, actually, if you can't put your leg up to your ear, do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, wow, I've not been doing it all along. <laughs> Randy, if you have that trick, pull it out on stage, people will be like, oh my gosh, oh, this is terrible. Uh, if I have time, and I did this actually with the, the uprising kids, I um, I just have them run along the diagonal in various artist artistic ways, or practice jumps. Um, we can do that on our stage. Most stages will su support some jumps. Turns are a little riskier because uh, it involves a balance, which um, at least our stage I found is really hard to balance on because um, it's it's pr pretty narrow. So uh, I would say get a, a basic ballet knowledge. I, I also teach falls, like how to appropriately fall. And that again is coming from my modern dance training in the 90s, because everybody was falling. Like that was the big, the big thing was like a bunch of modern dancers ran on stage and then we would just dramatically fall to the side. So it's like how to fall appropriately, um, safely. Um, another way to just get yourself a, as a little more the physical improviser. So um, in case you have to fall on stage or you want to fall on stage or uh, someone in Downs who is falling, um, I've got three different falling techniques to, to tell you how to do. Uh, and then uh, there is so much media right now that people can consume about any kind of dance that they want to discuss, discover. So like our own PNB has been putting up amazing dances and actually PNB has gotten more contemporary over uh, time because I think they want to attract younger audiences and um, there will always be the swan lakes and the nutcrackers and those are great, those, those are important. But I think dance companies in general are getting far more diverse as far as what they're showing. So any uh, aspiring mover out there can, uh, I mean, you could look locally, you could you could look, you know, globally. Um, I cannot think of any off the top of my head. Um, but But yeah, that's my, trying to think of I mean yeah I'm trying to think of you know in order to keep moving at home I've been using just dance on the connect and that's showing me lots of new moves right so there's like video games out there that could like get you <laughs> get you in the mood right. um yeah so cool yeah you're uh <laughs> talk about dying the swan which was a go-to move for you in your choreography for Trey Parker's Cannibal the Musical, which you and I worked on together. Yeah. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and we had, yeah, we had good old George Baxter do the Dying Swan. Um, 
<laughs> and uh, but to me, I bring that up as a segue into the history. But I still want to talk about movement and dance because there you had a whole variety of people. Um, uh, some were movers and some weren't. Yeah. And uh, and I thought you did a great job, especially because you know, as I remember the experience, it's kind of like, hey, Mara, will you choreograph this thing? Oh, and by the way, you have like two days. Um, so uh, so considering that, it was even better. Um, but you know what? were the challenges there because i mean you've got people who yeah. can people who can't who yeah. will um and so in terms of thinking in terms as i guess maybe this is more of a choreography question you yeah. know looking at what you have and then how do you choreograph to those people right so this is what i love and this is my i think this is my history as a choreographer is getting people who don't think they can move to be movers and you know when i was in college i wanted huge uh, casts because I thought like the more people on stage, the more interesting. And so I would literally just put uh, a sign up in the lounge that was like, we're doing a dance show. Anybody's welcome show up at this time. And so I would get people from all majors and all walks of life coming and I would cast all of them because I wanted bodies on stage and mass. And because the movement was very pedestrian, that term is, was also overused in the 90s. So it didn't require any technique. Um, it just required you, you to be able to walk across the stage in a pattern. So, um, and so I got a lot of joy out of that because I like seeing people that would tell me I'm not much of a mover apologetic, doing freaking leaps across the stage. Part of it is I would ask them, most people have some big move that they do at parties, right? Or some some party trick, right? Um, and I would ask what their party trick was, or what can you do? Um, and like I knew one guy totally stiff as a board, but he could do a backflip from standing. Like it's just one, like the only thing he could do, right? It was like a or some kind of flip where he's like, well, I can do this. So that that was like entry level. Like what can you do? And then we go from there. Now, I did not do that in Cannibal because I was also eight months pregnant. <laughs> Which would be the other funny thing. The first run of Cannibal was uh, extra challenging because not only were the other improvisers and, and cast members new at this, but I was like not able to do as much. So we were all a little impeded. But I think it's the spirit of camaraderie. Uh, we're all in this together. There's no judgment. Um, there's no pretension. I think a lot of dance has sort of this pretentious overtone and that's silly and needs to go. And so it's uh, usually doing a physical warm up. everybody together, we're all here, we're all doing it. And then um, some kind of thing, like just kind of sit, like watching the warm up and seeing kind of where everyone was physically. Oftentimes, if you're gonna be in a musical, um, the act of singing is fairly physical in itself. So it's, you know, you had people that were at least somewhat in touch with themselves in order to belt out a song. And then um, we, you know, I'll show the moves and I'll demonstrate it on myself and I'll, I'll demonstrate on somebody. In the case of Cannibal, we had a lot of like kind of big hearty numbers. Um, we also had uh, some smaller stuff, which was, um, super fun but um i i think also keeping it really light so like if somebody's not getting it um and i'm not able to show them finding another cast maybe my body's not reading to them but like maybe another cast member will be and usually there's one or two who are super you know for whatever reason they've got the choreography really quickly or this comes easier to them um and then just really keeping it super positive so you'll never see me with a cane banging out you know, you know, in the corner, uh, like some dance taskmaster. So yeah, right. I love it. That's the good stuff for me is like uh, making dance accessible or making movement accessible for everybody because it just adds so much. Yeah. Well, in that show, we had the benefit too that it's it's Cannibal the Musical. It's not like West Side Story or something, you know, where <laughs> people come expecting this amazing choreography and, you know, well executed and well danced. And yeah. Cannibal in yeah. a way sort so of the bar was low the bar was set low. <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah I mean, uh, it's the one show I've, I've you know I, I say this quite a bit in improv uh, uh, you know when we're doing games things like that but it was one time i got to say it in cannibal as a direction as i said you know the key thing here is don't give the audience time to think about what they're seeing <laughs> 
because as soon as you start thinking about the show, you kind of go, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense at all. (laughs) That was a lot of fun. And we got to revisit it a lot. And what I noticed, because the cast recently watched that show over uh, online, we've been like seven years. I I noticed that like uh, everybody really made it their own. So what I gave them as choreography uh, they often just roll, ran with it, especially since we were lucky enough to revisit it constantly. So I think I would just come and like reset everything when it was restaged, but very little work, you know, partly because the cast was so awesome. And, and again, it wasn't like, it wasn't complex choreography. It was, right. I mean, there was some tough stuff. We did a few lifts in there, right? Yeah. <laughs> we had some jumps and, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, and then, you know, it's interesting because, again, the, as a singer, a lot of them already know how to count, like, eight counts, and then you assign each count uh, a movement. And that's the other thing I should say is, like, really breaking it down. And some people don't work that way. Some people are listening to the music and the physical cues are coming from the music, and other people love the counts, you know, and they're like, as long as I can count, I know what to do. Um, I wish I was better at counts, but I'm, I'm totally a musical-inspired choreographer i mean i will break things down in counts because i know that that's what's expected of me as a choreographer but it is not intuitive (laughs) for me yeah um i know the answer to this question is both (laughs) but i'm gonna i'm gonna make you pick okay um in terms of i guess what you would rather see on the improv stage would be uh, an evening, a whole show where people were definitely more in touch with their bodies um, and aware of the movement or a show that was hit or miss with that, but there were one or two dedicated movement pieces um, that were putting the emphasis on dance and movement. So of those, you know, the answer is both, I think. Right. But, um, but if you had to pick one, I guess. Putting so if I hear you correctly, the first one is sort of movement and inspired influenced piece and the yeah. second one is like we're doing improv and now we break out for this one well, very yeah. or <laughs> i guess i guess a show that has a lot of movement in it but the audience isn't necessarily going to think oh that's a movement piece or oh that's dancing yeah. um versus a point where we go now we're going to do a ballet or now we're going to do uh oh. everyone rolling around uh <laughs> whatever it is Contact right? improv time. <laughs> probably the first one you know, uh, which is really, it's interesting because the second suggestion is is what we have now a little bit more, at least, you know, I haven't done theater sports in a long time, but um, at least in like the seven or 8.30 shows, it seems like we set aside a specific time for the dance and then we go back to the improv or then we go back to like the scene or the serious stuff. I would, I would much rather have a more movement inspired and some of our heralds have been like that where I'm like, wow, this, Harold had so much, I mean, this is me just loving long form in general, but like, wow, this Harold had so much more movement. I wonder why, or how did that happen? Um, um, I think I enjoy, I enjoy that more. Um, also because it feels more spontaneous, it reduces the pressure. Like if, how cool would it be if we started every show backstage being like, hey, let's just do a little bit more movement tonight, you know? And everybody was like, yeah, let's do it. Um, Versus like, okay, we're going to do a ballet and then, you know, and then everybody gets really nervous about the ballet and how do we organize that? And there's all this organization because we don't want to do ballet wrong. Uh, so I think the first one, just because it's, it feels freer and, you know, a freer improviser tends to be a better improviser. <laughs> I don't know if that's the right word. Um, but yeah, then it allows for more spontaneous magic to happen when everybody's feeling a little looser and open <laughs> uh so i want to spend the last 15 minutes or so uh that we have left um kind of talking a little about history but also just getting your perspective on stuff since you've been in and out of the group for 20 plus years yeah right? 20 plus years right on well, 98 yeah. right or yeah right 90 no well yeah 97 i started taking classes and then I think 98 was like, all right, you get to perform Sunday nights now <laughs> with the other apprentices. So yeah, right. 98. Wow. Um, yes. <laughs> so, so in terms of your journey 
uh, through it. You've done a lot of our, our shows, especially of the long form shows and things like that. Yeah. Are there a few favorites that you have that you kind of go, oh, I really like that show or yeah. I always come back to that or, you know, one or two or however many that you have? I, yeah, I think, uh, well, the my official start, I think, where I was like, oh, I'm, I'm really in it was when you cast me in Thalia. I think that was in 2007 and it was a sort of Greek inspired improv night and it was a cast of women and at the time I know we discussed this that was fairly cutting edge or or you know now we have casts of women all the time but back then it was it was still something new and to be explored and that was my first like improv run you know versus like I'm just going to call in and guest theater sports or do something with theater sports or judge theater sports. It was like moving away from uh, theater sports, which has its place. But um, boy, I really enjoyed, again, the freedom of Thalia. We were creating new games. You were bringing new ideas. Um, it was a class. It was um, a cast that had uh, students in it and uh, experienced improvisers. So we were all learning from each other. So um, I really enjoyed Thalia. Um, I really enjoyed uh, Mouth Wide Shut, I think I have the title right, uh, which was uh, Jay's piece uh, a couple years, like a year ago. Um, no talking at all, um, just movement and music, which I think I've said if I could do that show every night of my life, I would die a happy improviser because I just uh, really loved it. Um, and I learned a lot and um there's nothing like watching the audience go i don't know about this to being like yes encore uh so i appreciated that show a lot um and then yeah i just love a good herald you know i'm a i have you know i have this book that i've been writing notes in since 99 and i would say like half of them are herald notes for various herald workshops that i've taken a lot of them are other workshops and other guest improvisers right. that we've had but um Harold allows for, I think people go into it thinking like I'm open for anything. And so then you do get more movement and more uh, silences and um, more fluidity. And I, I really enjoy that. That's um, more my jam versus like, you know, fast theater sports. We're going to get honked any minute now. <laughs> sure, right. My comfort level is more that. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Good, yeah, and uh, yeah, and for those out in uh, improv world, um, yeah, Mara has this little black book that she writes notes in. Yeah, I and so it. from time to time, I'll give a note, and she'll all of a sudden pop out and say, you know, in June of two thousand five, you said, and it'll be this exact same thing that I said. Yeah. And, then, <laughs> and two things, I think two things, and this may sound negative, but they're not. Uh, one is I go, well, I got to get some new material. Um, and, uh, and two, I go, wow, you're still using the same book. I wish I, I wish I could say more, wiser things more often, um, you know, well, in volume seven of my notes. So I, I, I mean, it's really just, uh, more of my own consistency. And, and for the record, I did in 2019, get a new one, <laughs> you know, it's been like exactly 20 years. Um, and it's funny because I think a lot of, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of the notes are just like the classic, uh, keep it simple, don't be afraid of silence, um, uh, don't over offer. I mean, it's, it's really funny because like, I'll, I'll keep thinking like, I'm going to find the magic of improv in this book. And it's just time and time again, the same things are always coming up and we continue to explore them and, and discuss right. them. So yeah, but it is fun to quote you back because oftentimes, Sometimes I'll be lucky and I'll have like a backup example, but oftentimes it's like, um, I'd like to just a slight nuance in what you said 10 years ago. <laughs> um, but if anything, it's to say, hey, Randy, I was paying attention and I hear you. And um, I, we're all working on this still. And we're right. always been working on a lot of these concepts forever. <laughs> right. So yeah. in your experience, having done this for, again, a while, mm -hmm. um, for you as an artist, uh, not only a dancer, um, all the other identifiers that, that you go by. Um, how has improv changed for you? Both maybe good and bad. Like what's, yeah. what's a great big change that, like you mentioned earlier with, you know, when we did Thalia 
and it was kind of like, ooh, it's crazy, you know, uh, <laughs> cast of all women. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, and that's definitely changed. Uh, yeah. But other things that you notice, just yeah. you, you as an artist. I think, uh, well, I used to say like, oh, I, um, I prefer improv because it's the only kind of theater that scares me. Like that used to be my thing. My big thing. I haven't said that in 10 years. Um, because it did, right? It did. Like I, I got pretty bored of doing scripted theater because like you'd have the real amazing rehearsal process and then you would put the show up and then you'd have to do it for like six weeks and and I would get really bored. And so I was always like, oh, uh, improv keeps it interesting, it keeps it moving. And I I feel kind of crazy doing it. And so what I've enjoyed is feeling kind of less crazy doing it and more um, just confident at it and feeling like, I mean, this changes, right? Like I'll have an amazing weekend and then like the following weekend, I'll be like, I know nothing, you know, I, I, I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, but I think what I've, I've liked is getting, feeling less self-conscious. Like I think like the first five, six years of doing improv regularly, I was like really uh, in my head and, and worried and, and um, like checking myself backstage. And um, I still have nights like that, but I, I feel a lot more trust in the process and a lot more trust in my fellow improvisers and um, a lot more like, well, that happens, you know, like, you know, less um, sort of clinging to some sort of improv ideal. And so I think it's tapped into my inner, like being a little more laid back. Um, not worrying so much about what I look like and what do I sound like and, and really letting that go, which is hard to do. I'm always kind of working on that. I think um, that's something that's, you know, again, it's been like 20 years. So looking at myself as like an earlier improviser versus now, I think too, just really trying to take time to listen on stage. I mean, I can't tell you how many scenes where I'd just be like, wow, I missed, I missed that entire offer. And now I've got to like create something out of nothing or, you know, just feeling lost on stage and being like, well, I don't want that to happen again. <laughs> so really um, taking time to listen, which then does help in real life too. Um, and uh, yeah, so it seems cheesy to be like, it's maybe a better listener, but um, it has, you know, it has. And I, uh, I just, I think too, because I, you know, I run a busy, crazy household, improv allows me to tap into that sort of creative side of myself um, uh, that is limitless, you know, that kind of um, is expansive and big and I love talking about it and, and applying it to life and, and having those big discussions and workshops and ensemble and then, or, or like distilling what we're taking in politically or socially and then getting to explore that on stage. I mean, that's a huge gift to be able to uh, act it out, as so to say. So um, yeah, I could go on and on forever. But uh, I mean, I, I've, I've also found, especially if you're a parent, you have to <laughs> learn how to improvise quickly uh, with multiple, whether it's on the playground and you're carrying your kid out <laughs> or you have to advocate for them in school, which I have to do a lot. Uh, so you, improv has really helped me kind of think quick on my feet and be able to sort of um, convey like a hard message to uh, like a teacher <laughs> in the most loving way possible. And I think if I didn't have the improv experience, uh, that would be really intimidating to have to like step up and say, I need this or I want this. Uh, but having to do that every weekend where it's like coming up and creating with, with whatever comes at me, um, yeah, it helps you deal with life surprises a little bit more when you have some improv experience. That'll be my book title. <laughs> <laughs> One day. Right. Yeah, so, I mean, that's a big question, so that's a big answer. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, what, what, what's something you would never change about improv, and what's something that you think should change, or is changing? Um, I think we're getting there as far as uh, diversity, you know, when I started, it was a lot, a lot of, a lot of white guys, a lot of young guys, uh, no offense, we love them, they're important, uh, but we, we have an amazingly diverse cast, it's getting more diverse, we have a lot of women on stage now, um, and a lot of women in theater, and a lot of women in comedy, and, and um, 
that's that's all gotten better i think since you know the 90s um i think unexpected production has been great about um uh really making that a priority and so thalia was so great because um we we had a huge pool of women to choose from right it just happened to be who was available um and then we got to learn off each other and and um so that's improved um i don't want to change that um i can't think of what i want to change um i i guess less talking heads right i want to i want less less <laughs> less analyzing on stage and, and more silences and more listening. I mean, that's, that's what I, was that the question? <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Stuck in my head. Right. So uh, integrate the stuff that we were talking about earlier with the yeah. dance and movement. And... Full circle. Here we are. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. I'm trying to think huh. first. And is there something missing that you wish there was more of? You know, like you and I have talked a lot about because we're both uh, enjoy, you know, performance art and dance and, and um, you know, that kind of, kind of sensibility to it, which I don't yeah. see a lot of improv that has that. Um, and so I'm always trying to find opportunities to put that in, but not opportunities where the audience or everybody leaves, as you were saying earlier about some dance performances, like, what was that, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, which I've definitely done myself at other shows, yeah. uh, but make it accessible to our audience um, and also get the um, artistic buy-in from our players, our, our company members, our artists. Um, um, but are there, is there anything else that you see is kind of like missing from the art form? Oh boy. Like it's um, not even really there all that much. I don't know. I mean, I do feel like I can recognize an improviser that's done their, I hate to say homework, but I really like when we, um, I guess, hit higher. <laughs> I mean, there's improvisers that know so much about playwrights and I'm always just amazed and I love when they bring that on stage or there's improvisers that know so much about coding and they bring that on stage right or people because we're all good at something and our ensemble is amazing and so I I feel like people could bring more of their like authentic selves or what they do best I think oftentimes we get really stuck in these very basic narrative, basic characters, or like really extravagant characters and really extravagant narratives because we feel like the audience needs a whole lot. And right. they don't, they need our authentic selves and character works amazing and that's important. But also I think we just um, would have a little bit more fun with a little more authenticity of bringing your own, your own self and whatever that could be. So um, yeah, like what is, what is, what makes you shine and what can you do to bring that on stage? And, and um, you know, cause like, I, I feel like it's gotten better, but I feel like for a long time, you'd see like a lot of improv character tropes and that has gotten better, but like, oh, I lost my contact on the ground or I'm a dirt bag or I don't know, like real, or, or the pregnancy, there always has to be like a pregnancy scene or uh, somebody is giving birth that second or a yoga scene, which again, all of those have a place, but like, um, I have seen those scenes. I want to see more. And I think if people bring more of themselves onto the stage, then we get more interesting variety of improv, right? We get to see scenes we've never seen or, or uh, sides of life or careers or whatever you're into that we don't know. Um, yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, uh, no, totally. <laughs> but I, I mean, I also think it's it's, um, in order to do more of those things and even some of the things we were, we're talking about bringing in more dance mm -hmm. movement part of it is which I think we've done for the things that we've tried with UP a uh, pretty good job of of training the audience so to speak of, of you know being up front with them and saying here's what you're going to get or well, and it's different you know that was sort of the first show that comes to mind, which you were in, was you know that's us going forward with the beginning of Afterlife, which is as soon as they hit the lobby, yeah. the show has started, and it's and it's different, and that yeah. was to give the audience that sense of like, oh, this isn't just I show up and I sit down in the dark and 
watch a show it's like the moment you walk in the door you're confronted for lack of a better word um, wow. with the show and that was just to kind of wake people up and kind of go well you're not going to see your ordinary improv show this is going to be something different and then we've done other shows where that kind of training has happened and i think that you know the stuff that you're talking about that's also a really necessary component is this idea of like you know yeah. managing the audience expectation right right like how because like if i tell if i tell anybody like hey do you want to come to my modern dance show i would tell you most people are going to get that glaze i don't know i'm not going to get it look so so i'm really used to being like no this is different <laughs> but like how do we yeah like how do you kind of coach the audience along and say it's going to be okay it's still going to be good it's you know um right. it's not going to be everybody looking for their contact on the ground sorry i don't know why i'm on that one but like um that's why I loved Afterlife is we we knew it was going to be a more uh, serious show so we gave the audience visual cues right so how could we do that um and uh, I think I think Unexpected Productions is known right for providing something a little bit other in the improv world and so um yeah, and, and those shows have been popular. Like people have come to Afterlife repeatedly, you know, or have saw, or uh, Campfire is another great example too of like a show. I remember we, you were workshopping that when I started class in 98 and, uh, and trying it out. And I know you tried it out on the 500 class I was in. So that show is not your standard show by any means, but the last time we did it, it was huge. Like we had gigantic houses for that show. Um, was it because we've been doing it for so long and have just found the right way to do it? Um, or because people are like, I remember that from last year, I'm going to go see it again. Uh, but they were totally game for that yeah. show. Um, yeah, I think yeah. it's a combination of those things. It's, it's people who have seen it and liked it and they want to come back. And that's the show they come back to. They're not necessarily yeah. going to go to theater sports or something else. Um, and then also, I think, I like to think that part of the reputation we have when people are talking about coming to our show is when they read about something like that they know it's going to be something maybe a little different um, yeah. and that is uh, an encouragement rather than a discouragement so yeah uh, yeah we're just like i don't know it's so this time it's gonna be very funny <laughs> oh it's everyone rolling around again <laughs> Yeah. Which, you know, it'd be interesting to see if we were like, this is going to be just people rolling around. It's going to be really weird. I'd be curious <laughs> to see how many people would buy in and be like, all right, here we go, Unexpected Productions, let's go. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like the marketing factor is tricky. Um, like how, do, how do we do that? I mean, again, the visual cues in the lobby are awesome. And, you know, now that we're doing all this stuff, trying to discover online and what that looks like, you know, how do we educate the audience through all of our online content? Like, here's some of the things we've done and what we like to do. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, this all plays to my strengths, right? So I'm like, yes, how can we get more of that? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> no offense to funny haha -ha and like witty, amazing, uh, fast on their feet improvisers but I, i'm like yes how do we do the rolling around <laughs> right. to a certain extent um but i don't know i don't feel like people leave our shows you know even the more abstract ones thinking like oh i don't know what went on right i feel like you know the gift of getting to stand in the lobby afterwards is you get to take the temperature of how people took your show, you know, and if they're walking out silent and they won't make eye contact with you, then you know they didn't, they didn't get something out of it. But like, if they're like high-fiving you or giving hugs, I mean, ah, it landed, right? Yeah, so, and sometimes there's that separation between those two experiences where you think the audience is like, uh-oh. Yeah. And then out in the lobby, they're like, oh, that was great. And oh, that was fantastic, you know, and you're just like. Yeah. I mean, I am a huge audience spyer, and I, I did this a lot when I was choreographing too. Uh, I love hiding and watching the audience because it's for them, right? I mean, right. quite oftentimes it's like, we're just doing this for fun for each other, but ultimately it's it's for them. So I, I really enjoy watching, um, you know, like when I know something's coming up or I know a certain game that we're gonna do, um, like really watching them and seeing how they're doing. 
and what are they taking away from it? And uh, right. you're right, like it could be tanking in my head, but like, oh, the audience seems like they're doing okay. So I, I need to calm down, <laughs> stop trying to run, run the improv show in my mind. Right. So yeah, um, cool. it makes me sad. I'm like, oh, when can we do it again? <laughs> Sorry, anyway, we will, we'll do it. Yeah, well, yep. <laughs> um, we've gone a few minutes over, but thank you so yeah. much for being here, Mara. You know, talking about these things uh and again love what you're offering to the ensemble and oh. as a company member so uh keep doing that um <laughs> and i'll keep giving you notes that you've already got um, <laughs> i could write down in my new book several times over you know, yeah so uh, <laughs> um, I'll back to you yeah and uh so yeah so thanks tomorrow and thank okay. you guys for again spending an hour or so with us uh First one in 2021, we will be continuing them. We'll have one next week. Same bat channel, same bat time. Um, and again, if you want to find out more about shows, classes, uh, donations, uh, go to unexpectedproductions.org. Again, we're going to not have shows the next couple of weeks, but look for that first duo show on February 3rd and then a show on February 6th. That will be a poetry slash improv show um directed by tony beeman one of our ensemble members and also with uh, kent whipple who's sort of our house personal storyteller uh who runs our storytelling show inside story um doesn't even have a title otherwise i tell you the title but, or at least i don't know the title if they if they've named it so um that's how new hot off the press it's gonna be hot off the press. <laughs> yeah so uh so come check that out and again everything's available unexpectedproductions.org and once again, thanks tomorrow. And we look forward to seeing you, all of you next week. So, yeah. Thank bye. you. <laughs>